All right, James, we just had Harrison um, from Save Your Son's Twitter account on what do you think? It was uh, a lot on the Twitter algorithm, I think, a lot of nuggets of knowledge. Yeah, I love it. I, lo I love the stuff outside of the traditional search SEO stuff, just because obviously most people are trying to diversify now. And mm -hmm. yeah, growing the Twitter, as you mentioned, hey, it's a bit on the future. If you if you grow your Twitter account big, you know, when more people start migrating to Twitter potentially in the future, you can take advantage of that. But I think the other thing is as well, if you build one Twitter account, you can use that Twitter account to help build other Twitter accounts. So you can almost create yeah, sure. like a, a network, a PBN of Twitters. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's where like the real, real benefits come. But I mean, we cover a bunch of stuff in this podcast too and harrison dives pretty deep into the algorithm as well to help to help anyone who's looking to build their twitter kind of take advantage of it yeah man um and he, I, I like i love that he mentioned like uh his group of friends that all started together on twitter mm. like a little community of people who obsessed over twitter and all of them are probably killing it now um he name yep. dropped a, a couple killers in there um i recognize their names i'm sure they're doing six figures a month and it's good to see your group of friends succeed you know oh yeah for sure for sure and for anyone listening there's some, uh, some good actionable t uh, tips in there too to kind of get you started but as well down in the description there's the advised community obviously that that thing's running there pretty hard now with uh, i guess sean now kind of helping run the community in there there's lots of engagement lots of questions and discussion going on people sharing all sorts of things with their own websites with other websites um, essentially it's it's, a, it's like a community of friends like jackie was saying there a community there where you can kind of engage and get help with whatever you need tips tricks anything like that to do with building your website so make sure you check out that down the, in the description and that link will also have the discount code too perfect and uh yeah give the pod a listen give the video a watch and let us know if you want any other guests on thanks guys what's good everyone it's jackie chow and this is james delacy and you're listening to this week in digital marketing Right. Welcome to This Week in Digital Marketing. I have myself, James DeLacy, my co-host, Jackie Chow, and we have Harrison, and we're going to make his last name S-Y-S-U today because, again, he wants to stay anonymous with that last name. Welcome, Harrison. Hey, guys. Uh, you, can, you can do my last name. It's Shank, Harrison Shank, and uh, it's okay. a pleasure to be here, Jackie and James. Thank you, guys. We've been, been trying to get this one on the calendar for a while. We finally got it, and I'm really yep. I'm really grateful to talk to you fellas today. I think that's an exclusive on your last name. I don't think you've dropped it, it might anywhere be. else. I, well, here's the thing. Like, <laughs> anybody who wants to can, like, Google say... My, I have an LLC registered. Like you have to put your freaking information out there. So, so I'm, uh, I I'm, I do this full time. I don't have an employer. I'm no longer afraid of uh, of running afoul of any of their rules, and and I'm just we're just sending it. Yeah, <laughs> nice. And I think today will be an interesting topic for most people listening. Most people, are, or most of our audience, are in the niche site game, affiliate marketing, displays, building their own things. But recent changes, uh, I guess, by Google AI content, AI search coming out, it's becoming more and more difficult to differentiate your website, I guess, in the masses of search. And you're, you've been a master of Twitter and social media, and this is kind of where we're going to take this conversation. But do you want to maybe start, Harrison? Kind of what what you're up to now and kind of how you got to where you are yeah yeah so so i'm a huge advocate of social media i think it's it's the the online business is ultimately, at the end of the day, in my opinion, a traffic game. It's who who can command the most traffic and get it to get it in front of the right people, get the right people in front of the right offer, and that's how you make your sales. And there is no better way, no more cost effective, no more efficient way than to leverage these incredible algorithms that that these tech companies have built to find your audience with via content, grow and grow a following, spread your message, and ultimately get the right traffic over to your all. And when I started doing this stuff, I had that I have no idea what I was doing. I had no no concept of like oh this is you know there's a here's a five-year roadmap here's a plan here's here's how everything's going to look uh, one day after the other it was really what started for me is i run the the save your sons brand i started save your sons so if you're if you're familiar with that it's pretty big on twitter and instagram and growing on facebook and tiktok and i have a big email list relatively big and and i just started it because we were in the middle of covid it was like uh eight august 2020 and and our first son had been born in may of 2020 and I mean, james you're a dad you, you know what it's like mm -hmm. when you when you have a baby coming as men we get this this kind of thing where we're like oh man i gotta start i gotta get it together i gotta start making making some moves making some things happen and and you start thinking a lot about legacy and you start thinking long term and for me the way that manifested was i wanted to write down important life lessons for me that I wanted my son to have if something ever happened to me. And so I just started typing those out. Like, here's what, here's what I wish I knew when I was 20. Here's what I wish I knew when I was 18, whatever. And, and posting them on the internet and the message really resonated. And I'm really grateful for that. I, I still don't know, you know, it was definitely a little bit of lightning in a bottle. It wasn't, it wasn't 
anything special about me. It was the message and it was the timing of the message. And it just really caught on and it's continued to, to resonate and impact a lot of people. And so as, as that happened, I, I turned around one day after I've been, we've since had a second son and I turned around one day and I was like, you know, I got a pretty big, pretty big audience here. I'm working this nine to five job, but, but I know that there's something here with this audience. So, so how can I, how can I use this to make a living for myself to, to do this full time so that I can spend more time with my kids so that I can be a better dad, because that's what this is all about for me. And through a ser- through a long, journey i uh i was able to sort of crack that nut and and create a business around the brand and around what i what i had learned along the way and that's what i'm doing right now and so there's there's a couple big initiatives that we're undertaking with save your sons at the moment and i'm learning i'm learning more every day trying things some things work some things don't and that's that's what i love about online business that's what i love about entrepreneurship is you just do it and there's feedback immediately you know like right off the bat this was this was smart or you look like an idiot <laughs> one way or the other uh, you're going to keep getting better nice man um i'm a huge fan of your your like tag or your name save your sons it's like it, it really resonates with people because uh it's kind of like it's three words that says a lot and i think some of these larger accounts on twitter they're they're very generic and i think yours hits like a bit of a more emotions with uh with it um um, what were you doing full time before you like while you were doing Save Your Sons in the beginning? Yeah, so so first off, thank you, Jackie. I, and and I, I think there is something to be said for you know y- you can grow an audience around a lot of different messages, but if you're if you're if people can tell if a what you're saying means something to you. So this is they, mm-hmm. they, that comes across even if it's just a text based platform, which no one's going to be text based in five years. It's all going to be video, so get ready for that. But even if it is just text based, people can tell whether you really care about this stuff. So that's one thing. And then if you can position what you're saying in a way that also is emotionally resonant for other people. And for me, what it was all about was realizing that if we want to change the world from where I sit, in Raleigh, North Carolina, if I want to change the freaking world, the best thing I can do is encourage more guys to be dad because that's mm-hmm. going to have downstream effects in every single aspect of society. Every negative social outcome that you that you see on a day in day out basis would improve if more guys were dads. If we had lower rates of fatherlessness in our youth and kids growing up, and so I, that's a big part of my message, and I think that's a big part of why it why it resonates. It's like let's let's raise these young men up, save our sons, so that they are prepared for this this sacred role of fatherhood that, that's in front of them. They can take up that mantle and they can do a great job with it. And then to answer your question, I was, uh, so I'm, 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 a trained lawyer. Not a lot of people know that. I went to wow. law school. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, I graduated in 2015 and I never practiced. I knew about halfway hmm. through that um, <laughs> I didn't have the competitive advantage that I needed to be an elite level lawyer. And maybe if I had worked way harder than I was willing to work at that time, um, I could have maybe scraped it, scraped my way up there. But you know, those people are freaking computers. Uh, they, they read so fast and they regurgitate information so well. So I was like, you know, there, there, there's got to be another way, another another avenue for me to to do well and, and to get, get it going. And so what I did was after I graduated, I went to uh, I went I moved to Nashville and worked for a sports marketing startup. And what we did was we owned and operated uh, endurance sporting events all over the U.S., really all over North America. We had an event in Canada too, <clears throat> and and that was great because it was like there was like I was the third employee, something like that. And um, so it was like the scrappy startup days, which is my favorite. And I love that. I mean, that's kind of what my whole life is now. And we were trying things and we were saying, how can we grow this freaking business? I learned a ton. It was a lot of traveling. And so once I got married uh, in 28, I was there for six years, got married in 2018. We moved from Nashville back to North Carolina, where we're both from. And that's actually where the company was based. So it was an easy move. But, you know, got to a point where it was like, you know, the we're, we're, we're gonna we want to start having kids traveling's a lot um, i wasn't sure we were in the middle of it. covid hit and you can't do sporting events you couldn't do sporting events in 2020 <laughs> so like if we were a nine million dollar business uh, in 2019 we went down to like two million or less in uh in 2020 and and it was tough and i was like and the stars aligned and i said well i'm gonna try shooting out these fatherhood messages and see what happens and two years after that so it was about two years of i was doing both where i was doing the online Whoa, okay. brand building and my full-time job and i left my full-time job for good back uh almost a year ago exactly the end of august 2022 nice nice man um wh- why don't we dive a d- bit deeper into uh how you grew your account in the beginning because i i'm guessing a lot of our listeners are probably interested in that um yeah you you put out some like meaningful content onto Twitter. And were there, were there any growth hacks that you utilized to get the initial eyeballs on it? Um, are you in any of those like engagement groups or are you simply just putting out good content and engaging with others and it was more of an organic type of thing? Yeah, that's a great question, Jackie. And this is what I've 
one of the things I do for a living now is help people do exactly what you're talking about. So like help myself. people go from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> James and I, James and I have been working on something together for, for a few months now. We're going to keep going on it. And, um, and one thing that I always tell people is you have to freaking love this. You have to become obsessed with it. And I'm not saying you have to become so obsessed with it that you're Howard Hughes and the aviator and your fingernails are three inches long and you never, you don't leave the house and you're peeing in glass bottles, but this has to be a really big part of your life. And you have to understand that, that for the next few months, at least as well, while I get traction with this thing, that I'm going to become obsessed with. There's a, there's an interview with Mr. Beast, who's the best at this in the world, what we're talking about. Nobody has done it like he has. And, and, and it, it was funny because I saw it after I'd kind of already gotten my audience going as well. But what he talks about is at the beginning, he had a group of like seven or eight. Right. I don't remember how, have you seen this <laughs> one? Like seven yeah, or eight yeah. other mm. YouTubers. It was on Rogan. Yeah, I think that's what, yeah, that is where it was. And he was just, he said, all we did was talk about how to freaking grow a YouTube channel. We talked about the algorithm. We talked about thumbnails. We talked about analytics. We talked about subject matter. We talked about how to respond to comments. I mean, all, they just, that was all they did all day long. And they were just in it. They were just obsessed with it in that way. And for better or worse, that's kind of how I was with Twitter at the beginning. X now, not Twitter mm. back then. <laughs> uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the growth hacks, Jackie, like the, I was in groups where we, where we sort of were like, you know, I got this piece of content. Can you guys go engage on it? Um, because that at that time helped in the algorithm. It doesn't really help much anymore. I can talk about how the algorithms, all the algorithms sure. work now. But at the time, they, that was helpful. That was a big part of it. But the real benefit I got from being in groups, this is why I tell all, all our clients too, is, is not the engagement, it's the relationships. Because just like Mr. Beast said, he had his core group of seven or eight, whatever it was, people. That's what I have for online business too. It's, call it a mastermind, call it whatever you want. But without that, I would have gotten frustrated. I would have quit. If I didn't have the right people who on a down day when you can go to them and be like, dude, this this sucks. What's going on? What am I doing wrong? And they'll they'll tell you to suck it up or they'll tell you the right thing you need to hear at the right time. If I hadn't had that, I don't think I'd still be doing this. I think I would have given up. I think I would have quit. And so that's what I tell everybody is the, the best hack. There's one really two things you need to do at the beginning. Or we'll call it three. You need to get obsessed with this to, to a point where you you don't hate it and you're in it for an hour or two hours a day at minimum. You need a network of people who are taking it just as seriously as you are. And then you need to pay attention to what other people are doing. You need to see what kind of content other people are posting, what's doing well. And you need to let that flow. You need to take lessons from that and put it into your own content, put your own spin on it, your own unique twist, your own unique subject matter. But you need to be watching what other people are doing. And if you do those three things and you're not an idiot, then you're going to grow an audience. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned that uh, these engagement groups don't really work anymore. Uh, why is that? So it's funny, man. When when I started, it, like, what what is the point of a social media algorithm? The point of an algorithm. A lot of people don't actually understand this, but I mean, you guys probably do, but it might be helpful for your listeners. The point of a social media algorithm is to get people hooked on the app. That's it. Every single social media algorithm, that is the whole point. They want people spending more hours on their apps because why? Because they can sell ads to those people. Ads become more valuable if the average user time ex is extended. So every algorithm was built with that in mind. It was like, what, what kind of content can we promote to get people really engaged and, and not wanting to leave our app. And at, when I started on Twitter in 2020, the way the algorithm measured that, they measured the attention of their users, was through engagement. So purely through likes, retweets, comments. So you could game the algorithm back then. If you went in and you, and you had 100 people, I never did it to this extent. But if you had 100 people in a group and you posted a thread, and you said, hey, everybody, go go like and retweet and comment on this thread really fast. And that's a signal to that old algorithm. Hey, this is getting engagement. That means it's mm -hmm. getting people hooked mm -hmm. on our app. That means we're doing what we want to do. We're extending the time users are engaged on our app. So we're going to promote this further and show it to people who aren't currently following this person, which which worked for, you know, I think what, what really killed that sort of style of algorithm was TikTok. YouTube was doing it for years, but they were kind of on an island. But TikTok came on as like a phone app, a real phone app. And they they changed, they flipped the algorithm on its head. And what they started measuring was not necessarily engagement. That stuff still helps. It's still a signal to the algorithm that people are spending time with this content. But what they really did was they started measuring the length of time that people engage, that people watch and consume your content. So if you go on TikTok and you look at your analytics, it tells you like the average view time is 40 seconds. So the average view time is one minute. The longer your average view time, the more likely that video is going to get boosted because that's a signal to the algorithm. People aren't scrolling past this. They like this. They're going to watch it. If these if these bozos watch it, we're going to show it to some more bozos and we're going to get more and more people watching our watching this content and it's going to grow. And all of the other social media companies now <laughs> operate that way. So on Twitter, X, uh, if, if you if you create content that people spend a long time 
engaging with or consuming or reading, whatever you want to call it, that's the way to get shown to new people right now because the algorithm is going to pick up on that. The algorithm knows if I'm scrolling and I see James's tweet, if I just stop scrolling and stare at it for 20 seconds, I don't even have to press a button, I don't have to do anything. The algorithm sees that and goes, oh, this guy's stopping the scroll. People are reading this. We're going to show this to more people. And that's when you see the impression counts go up. And if the impression counts are obviously, if they're greater than your number of number of people who follow you, that's a signal that a ton of people have seen this, didn't follow you. And that's how you gain a follow. Hmm. So you think, uh, <clears throat> so you think like time on tweet is probably the most important metric right now as of now. Absolutely. What I tell people is imagine a stopwatch. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you, that I post something and Jackie's scrolling and he sees my post. The second he sees it, the stopwatch starts. Stopwatch starts ticking. The longer that stopwatch ticks before Jackie moves on to somebody else, Jackie says, screw this, I don't want to read this, and scrolls past and scrolls down. The longer that stopwatch is going, the more of a signal that is to the algorithm that this is the type of content we want to promote. Let's show this to some new people. Let's get this out. Let's show this to people who, who may not be following this person because it's proving that it's getting people to stop and spend more time. It's all about spending more time. And you can do that through a lot in a lot of ways. You can write the long form tweets. Those do really, really well right now for mm -hmm. that reason. A, a they're they're boosting it because it's a new feature and that's important to social media companies. But it's also more thing more stuff for people to read. It takes longer to read a long form thousand word tweet than it does a two hundred eighty character tweet. And so if people are spending more time, that stopwatch is ticking longer and longer. And so it's showing it to more people. Another thing you can do uh, is a quote kind of a hack is um is ask ask a question that that draws a lot of conversation because that stopwatch is still running if jackie reads my tweet and i say something stupid and he's like oh my god this guy's getting dunked on he's got a yeah. thousand comments <laughs> i'm gonna go read what these people are saying about him if he's doing that i'm still getting boosted i'm still getting pushed in the algorithm because he's reading my comments and that still counts as engagement on my content does that mean you're choosing to do long form tweets over threads i have been yeah i have been i didn't okay. mean to tell you this james uh, but, yeah <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna but, start uh, doing that. yeah do them dude because it's a it's a new feature right and elon also I, i've i've heard rumblings from me trying to pay attention that he thinks the threads are stupid because it's like a string of tweets like it just is it's a, it's always been a clunky kind of thing like why not just write a blog post and post it in a tweet which is basically what you can do now so so i think they're de-emphasizing traditional threads a little bit but also they are emphasizing these long form tweets and it's keeping that stopwatch run. It's keeping the stopwatch running longer and longer. And the more you do that, the more new people are going to see your stuff. Gotcha. That's interesting. Um, so like a video would also be pretty uh, important then nowadays. I think I feel like X is uh, pushing video quite a bit nowadays. Um, and you mentioned time on tweet is like an absolute number, right? It's not relative to, for example, if you put an hour long podcast on Twitter and someone spends like the average time spent is like 10 minutes. Would, but then 10 minutes is insane for a tweet. Would that mean it, it would go nuts? Like that my, tweet? my guess is I haven't tested it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think my guess is you're right, Jackie. It is relative. So so if they're like the Tucker stuff, Tucker Carlson, the stuff yeah. he's been posting, I mean, he'll post an, an 80 minute interview. I actually got sucked into one last night. I watched like 50 <laughs> the longest like interview I've watched in years. But I was like sitting there, I was like, dang, I've been watching this forever. And then I go and look at the views and they're, they're they've been climbing like a million every 10 minutes <laughs> something and i think it is because even if even if people are only making it 10 percent of the way through a two-hour video that's still a really good signal to the algorithm that this is the type of content that gets people hooked on yeah. the app they're spending more time here let's boost it i have a feeling uh tucker's example might not be completely or like the algorithm I, I feel like um there's people in the back pushing some algorithm buttons so uh more people <laughs> like more news people come to the platform because he's like one of the first movers right um he is yeah he's he's prime mover Mover, baby and, yeah. and, that, and that's definitely that's definitely happens um i, I, mean, I try not Elon to speculate well. on it yeah. um but but yeah i mean there's there's certainly creators that that twitter wants to emphasize we'll put it that way for whatever for whatever reason he's probably one of them for the reasons that you said i mean if he can prove this model of being a big news personality without the need for a network and twitter or x de facto becomes his network that's really valuable for a company like X, more valuable than somebody like me posting my fatherhood meme. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so that's, that's definitely happening. And, um, it's, it's, it's part of it. Yeah. I think, um, speaking on, uh, this, uh, these threads, uh, disappearing from the for you timeline, I actually see a lot less of the thread boys, quote unquote. Uh, which I was actually guilty of. I was testing certain <laughs> things out, um, testing like the retweet services. I'm sure you know of them. Uh, and it, it worked relatively well, but it's not like, I don't know. 
I felt pretty cringe doing it, but I got hella views. It was like 500k to a million views each each time. And then we're just posting nonsense, like marketing campaigns type of thing. Um, so I guess my question to you is, let's say it works now, like uh, these uh, thread boys, really generic, very general threads work re- still work well. Um, how do you balance between doing stuff that nurtures your existing audience as opposed to like reach a new like new group of people? Because you got to balance that right otherwise your existing group of people if you post too much cringe shit they're gonna be like fuck this guy i'm unfollowing um but if you never grow what's the point of you know obsessing over you know yeah and my my philosophy has always been bigger is better which goes against the grain for a lot of the conventional wisdom where people will say you can have a coaching business with a thousand followers a month or a thousand followers on your account which is Mm -hmm. true you can but what they don't talk about is that coaching business is going to, the sales you're making is going to be 100% based on your outbound efforts. So you're a sales, you're, you're, you're doing sales messaging, DMs, cold DMs, cold emails all day long. If you have a thousand followers and you have a high ticket coaching, offer. if you have a high ticket coaching offer and you have 500,000 followers or even a hundred thousand followers, then you have inbound traffic in a much more meaningful way than you would if you were really small. So my strategy has always been more is better. I'd rather have a hundred thousand followers where 10,000 of them might buy from me than 10,000 followers where 8,000 of them might buy. I'd rather have 10% than 8, than uh, 10,000 than 8,000 as a gross number. And so I've always had this philosophy that bigger is better. Now you're right, Jackie, that you can't just post crap because you, you if you grow, if you grow the long, <clears throat> the wrong way for too long and you get garbage, brain dead idiots following you, eventually that's all that's going to follow you. And that's, 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 a, that's mm-hmm. a bad way to, to grow. Your options become kind of limited because your traffic isn't as valuable. That's what, that's what the value is in a large social media following to an extent, mostly just you, you command traffic, but you need that traffic to also be valued. And the way I balance it is really simple. I just pay attention. I say, is, is what I'm doing, is what I'm posting now, A, does it pass my own sniff test? Like, am I, is it cringe? Yeah, I post cringe things all the time and I'll see them like a week later. I'll be like, damn, did I really, did I really post that? That's so stupid. But, <laughs> but I'll, I'll pay attention and I, and I want it to, you know, generally pass my own, pass my own Smith test sniff test. And then I, I focus on my growth numbers, my analytics really, really closely still to this day. And I make sure that the profile visits that I'm, that I'm driving are, uh, are relative to the impressions are high. I want to keep that number high. I want my follower growth to remain steady. A few different things that I look at to say, okay, this is, this is as best as I can tell indicative of good content. This is indicative of bad content and try to differentiate between the two and post <laughs> mostly stuff that, that is optimized for growth and uh, and finding the right people to grow with you. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, what's what is what does your team look like right now? Is it just you? Um, do you have ghostwriters? Do you like? Do you have people answering your DMs? Um, you can't be doing everything, right? Or can you? Yeah, right now I am, <laughs> and and um, it, it it can't be that way for forever. Uh, I'm actually kind of at the point now where it's it's starting to be. I need to I need to think about outsourcing something. But right now, all the content you see is written by me unless I find a meme somewhere and post it in which case I, I will never take credit for something that I didn't create if I created a meme it'll usually have my not always but usually it'll have my name on it if it doesn't then I just post it however I found it but yeah all the content that I post is is made by me uh, the, the the sales I'm doing are, are done by me um, I do have really important partners so I have a few big offers that I that I do that make up 90% of my business one is is coaching for branding and social media business growth uh, another one is <clears throat> ghostwriting for for other people, which I don't, I don't have any active clients, but we were, we got that up to 20,000 a month for a few months earlier this year and decided to scale it back. And then the other one is a, um, is a men's retreat that we do once a year, maybe twice a year, but we're going to do the next one soon where we, we take uh, usually dads who are, who want to build an online business. They pay us and they come out and learn from us for a week. And for each of those three offers, I have a partner. And that's another really important thing that I've taken away from this is I don't think if I, they, they they're smart dudes. They they want this thing as bad as I want it. And without them, I don't think that I would have made a fraction of the money that I've made. I don't think I could have left my job. We're much stronger with a partner. I'm much stronger with a partner than I would ever be on my own. And I think that's pretty universally applicable. So I would reckon that's why networking is so important when you're at the beginning. You kind of find that mastermind. You find that group of people who, who are going to grow with you. And then you and then as you're ready to start making some money, you, you take a couple guys aside and you're like, hey, you know, your skills are this, my skills are this. What if we join forces and put together this this expensive offer to really get results for people? And that that was a big game changer uh, for me. But yeah, to a roundabout way, no no uh, no staff right now. I'm doing my uh, I'm doing my kids podcast. I'm doing my 
uh, I do one of those every day and, um, and then I, I make my content and then I talk to clients and maybe write an email or something, but I'm, I'm not one of those guys with a crazy notion template schedule. Um, I just kind of know the two or three most important things I have to do and I come in and do them and that's it. Nice man. Yeah. sounds like a good setup. You, you gotta start probably delegating soon. Um, once you delegate, you're going to be like, I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, right, I know this is you're what right. I, I say to everyone. Um, but nice, nice. Uh, what, let's talk a bit more about the partners that you mentioned. Are they part of the group that, you know, when you first started off during COVID, was this the same people that you were kind of like scheming with in these group chats? Is it, is it like the same partners? I guess they're all on Twitter, right? They're all huge on Twitter. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, man. And and it's funny. Can I, can I name drop? <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, yeah. Uh, so Go crazy. It's funny when I started. Um, I don't I don't have offers with with the people I'm about to mention right now. But uh, but when I started, I was in group chats like I was talking about with Dan Co, J.K. Yeah. Molina. Um, who else? Yeah, Aaron Will. A few guys that are really big that are really established and have have these big businesses. And we were we were all guys with like a thousand followers. I think when I I met Dan Co. He had like he was the biggest out of all of us. He had like seven thousand on Twitter, and that was it. And we were in there every single day talking to each other, being like, "Dude, what what was wrong with this post? What was wrong with that post?" And so the, some of the guys I work with now, um, Eddie Kwan is another guy. Uh, he he's one that I work closely with a lot. Uh, Dino Creation Two Four Seven, as as people know him on Twitter, uh, and then Andy Andy Strom is my third my third partner, who's the sales the sales guru uh, on on Twitter, the high ticket sales coach. And these are all guys that I've known for from the beginning who who we just kind of hit it off. We we're like, Hey, we're aligned on a lot of these values. We, we get along really well. And we have, we have strengths that complement each other. Let's start sending out these offers and start helping some people. And the next thing you know, it's just, it just goes. Cool. I, um, yeah. What's funny to me is uh, 10 years ago, you told me I'd be working with people like strangers online. I would have said like, you're losing your mind. Um, <laughs> I, know, I know. But now it's like a very common thing nowadays. Um, but yeah, this is very Mr. Beast X S, you know, uh, cause this is exactly what he did. Um, um, in the beginning, he's also from North Carolina. He right? is, yeah. I? He's I he I didn't know that until recently, but yeah, he's I think he's from Greenville, which is like sixty miles east of me, something like that, oh, an hour east mm-hmm. of me. Yeah, I think he's got a compound there, right? He's like rented out a ton of space for his team. I think he's got a huge operation, but yeah. Um, so speaking revenue wise, what's like the current split between your offers? Because you mentioned you scaled back on the ghostwriting stuff. Um, high ticket coaching, I'm guessing, is pretty huge. Uh, that's I guess you also have sponsorships. You take sponsorships, right? Is that something? A little you, bit. You... Uh, rarely, it's huh. almost. It's probably eighty percent right now. Is is coach is like business brand growth coaching. So like helping somebody. They got this idea. Maybe they want to be a coach. Maybe they want to be start an agency or whatever. I've done. Mm-hmm. I've built those businesses and I've built them through social media. So we'll say, okay, let's let's build this business through um, growing your audience, getting your offer right, learning how to sell it. That's the that's probably eighty percent right now. Um, maybe ten percent is my course, which which serves as a pretty good lead generator for the high ticket offer. It's like seventy bucks. Uh, Dad's online business toolbox, and you can go buy that and, and it's just me it's a new module I, I update it every month so there's a new thing that i'm learning every month and it's like a video module and um that one that one you know even though the ticket the, the value is lower it generates revenue on the back end and then the the, uh, the remaining 10 percent right now um we're not selling our retreat yet so the remaining 10 percent would be like promotional stuff I, i'll very rarely decide to purely promote something um usually i try to couple it with like some other service because i can charge more mm-hmm. if i'm like hey um, yeah. i'll promote your company because i like it but I'll also want to give you some give you some consulting or something to go along with it. But sometimes I'll just do pure pure sponsorships, and I'd like to do more of that. That's one of the strategies behind growing my my kids' podcast, and I'm actually about to launch a regular uh, traditional podcast um, to because those are those are so much more monetizable, I think, from a sponsorship standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to see that 80% one on one or two on one coaching offer that I have making up the majority of my revenue right now. I'd like to see that go down to 10% or, or even less where I'm taking on a couple clients here and there, but getting the rest of the, getting the rest of my money more quote passively through advertisements and sponsorship. Yeah. I think a uh, newsletter would be a good source too. How, how many subscribers do you have now? I saw you also have a newsletter. Yeah. I'm just shy of 15,000, which is, Sick. I need to, I need to up my game, dude. Because yeah, you, once you, once you get to like, I don't know, somebody told me the Babylon B has 2 million subscribers on theirs Whoa. and they are making a million dollars plus per month just purely on sponsorships. Holy shit. It's crazy. Yeah. 
So, so the number, the, the math works if you can get that scale and, and it's something that I'm, it's been an initiative, it's been an initiative for me for three, four months to grow my newsletter. I I ignored it for years Mm -hmm. and, and now I'm really trying to grow it and I've been growing, I don't know, a couple thousand a month for the past few months. Nice. Nice. Um, what kind of strategies are you using? Are you just appending them at the end of your tweets? Like, uh, like I am, or are you, I don't know, are you hooking them in with like some sort of one tweet hook? You know what I mean? I try a few different things. And, and I'm always looking at link clicks relative to impressions that shows me if what I'm doing is working or what I'm doing isn't working. And for mm-hmm. me, a good link click relative to impressions for Twitter is if the tweet gets 100,000 impressions, I want my link clicks to be 400, somewhere in that range. Um, if it's much less than that, I'm like, oh, either this copy wasn't good or it was in front of the wrong audience or whatever. So I pay attention to that. And then I try a few different ways. So I have a lead magnet that does really well. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's like a 50 books you can read with your kids, 50 old books you can read with your kids. And I'll promote that that on Twitter and on Instagram um, through my Instagram stories. That's another really good one. Uh, I, I highly recommend people taking the time to grow on Instagram mm-hmm. because the link distribution is really good there. Uh, not as good as it could be, but it's still pretty good. So that those oh, are the mean two like link clickers on the stories, right? I hear. That yeah, crazy. yeah. Like my my ratio of views to clicks on Instagram is way higher than it is on Twitter, which is mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. Wonder why that is actually. But I've, I've also seen that on my other brands. It's pretty. Uh, huh. And are you? Uh, how are you growing? Do- yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. It, it probably just has something to do with with the way people engage with the app. I think I think like people come to Twitter to learn. People come to Instagram to shop. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. That's broad generalizations, but but I think generally speaking, that's a that's one way to think about it. And uh, how have you been growing on Instagram? Are you using Reels? Are you uh, memes, text the best, based the, uh, the, images? You know? Yeah, the, I'm I'm not doing Reels yet which is another thing that I'm looking forward to. I've done a few, but I'm looking forward to getting my podcast launches end of September, my, uh, my dad's advice podcast and getting some clips like, like we're doing will be really helpful for real growth because reels, just like we were talking about earlier, that stopwatch is running and, and reels is a relatively new feature for Instagram. They're really emphasizing it and it, it sucks people in and people watch them for longer. And so if you look at your analytics on a reel, you'll see that it's getting shown to way more non-followers relative to the total impressions than just a standard post would be. And like I'll I'll do a carousel of 10 memes that are maybe a little bit related, but maybe not. And my audience will love it. They'll eat it up. It'll get shown to over half my audience, which is pretty good, but it'll only get shown to a few thousand non-followers. And the reason for that is that people aren't spending as much time. They're not spending the time that they would to watch a whole one minute reel, which is why when I'm coaching people on Instagram, what I tell them is don't optimize for save for likes, optimize for saves. Saves is the little Mm. bookmark feature. Mm, So my best performing post on Instagram, I gained like 20,000 followers. My best, this is my best one I've had in a year was, uh, was a post about 20 skills you can teach your kids. I think was what it was called. And it was literally just a list of like, teach them how to teach them how to play poker, teach them how to play chess, teach them how to throw a ball. <laughs> it was just a list of a hundred things. But every person who saw that, I mean, I had like a hundred thousand saves that post yeah. because people were like, Oh, I'm going to come back. I, I want to save this. Maybe I've got kids. I want to reference this, or I'm going to save it for when I do have kids. And that's a crazy good signal. A, it means people are spending more time reading it because they're, they have to read enough of it to decide to save it. But then it's also a good signal for the algorithm that people are going to come back to this later. And of course, that's what they want. They want people coming back to their app. Hmm, gotcha. <clears throat> Going back to Twitter, um, I think you have a you're in a unique position to be, you know, the there's some Twitter accounts out there that kind of engagement bait these trolls on Twitter, like you would lean into something that's like politically left or politically right and just take a hard stance and people go nuts over it. For example, uh, do you know Nick Huber from the sweat, uh, sweaty startup? I, I don't know him. But yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen his like engagement t- uh, bait tweets where he just says <laughs> like, yeah, you should offshore everything and people lose their mind <laughs> yeah i think i know what you're talking about yeah and yeah. each one gets like at least 500k every time and he posts the same tweet like like clockwork every three months and people take it every single time um is that on your radar uh i know it's very polarizing so you might get like canceled a couple times on the way <laughs> yeah, up but uh like you said bigger is better right yeah i mean you, you know court attention at all costs whatever uh, robert yeah. said i uh I, I, I actually surprised, like, I think a lot of people are drawn to the brand Save Your Sons because it does feel like some sort of uh, homage to the past. Mm-hmm. I, it, it, it reminds people of a time when maybe things were or maybe things weren't simpler and easier, but we've romanticized that in a way that in our heads, perception is reality. Okay, th- th- then that's that's how things were back then. And, and that usually comes with a branding of, oh, this guy's reactionary or this guy's, you know, 
leans right or whatever. And and whether I do or don't, I don't I don't want that to really come through in my content. I want my content to just be normal stuff that's common sense. Like, come on, why? Since when is saying that we need more dads in the house a right wing virtue? It shouldn't be. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> it should be common freaking sense. Anyone who un, who has a baseline understanding of statistics can tell that things are worse when we have less dads in the house. Okay, so one plus one equals freaking two. I'm not out here saying anything that's that should be controversial. Now, people will find a way to be offended by everything. I posted something the other day, a video that went really viral. It got like 5 million views. Um, it's an old video. I mean, I've seen it a million times. It's been around forever. But it's like a video from the 80s. Uh, somebody was walking around with a camcorder in the 80s and just filming people. It looks like somewhere in the southeast US, maybe Florida or something. And, and the people were just noticeably, they looked healthier to me. They looked happier to me. You know, they were out there smiling. They were just out on the street smiling, talking to each other. And everybody's thin and everybody's, everybody's optimistic. And so I just posted, I was like, you know, th these people look different than, uh, it looks like something's changed. What, what do you think it was? So that's about as close to an engagement bait post as I'll do. Like that was clearly, mm -hmm. I knew that people were, <laughs> some people were going to find a way to be triggered by that. And a lot of people were, uh, but, <laughs> which is also funny. It's like, what, why are you so, why do you get so upset that, uh, that somebody will, will suggest that things used to be better and, and things weren't all better back then, but, but some things were, some things weren't, and it's okay to point out the differences, but people get really offended by that. And, uh, and yeah, that does help. It, it helps drive engagement for sure. So what do you, what do you suggest as a posting schedule for people who are getting started on, on Twitter? Do you do have maybe like a formula throughout the week where you're posting a certain amount of long form, short form pictures, memes, videos, etc. I don't have, I don't really, what I, what I try to do is get one, at least one quality post that I think is going to do well, both speak to the, speak to the audience that I want, but also get, maximize my reach. I just try to do one of those a day. And there's, there's some pressure now that like you're getting paid by the impression, I guess. Like I don't, I don't ever expect that to be a, a huge percentage of my revenue as a business. But you see a lot of people like posting more and more thinking that it's going to increase the number of impressions and they're going to get a bigger check from X at the end of the month. But for me, you know, I might post two times a day now on average instead of one, but it's always been about, let me put out something that I think is good, that I think is going to get uh, outsized impressions for, for my audience so that I can continue to grow and continue to command more and more traffic that's in line with my niche. And some, maybe it's one thread of, or not a thread, sorry, a one long form post a week. And um, the rest of the rest of the stuff I'm posting, I'm trying to drive conversation because that conversations, if you're driving a conversation, that's when that stopwatch really gets ticking and people spend minutes, minutes, minutes reading the responses, reading the comments, getting in arguments, whatever people can argue under my tweets. I'm happy with that. And, and so that's, that's kind of how I optimize it is like, I want to spread this message and I want to drive a conversation. And then I just make sure that my impressions are staying healthy and that my profile clicks relative to my impressions are staying healthy and that my conversion rate is still at that 30, 35% of followers. Nice. Hmm. What do you think of uh, Elon taking over X and all these changes? Do you think, um, are you bullish or bearish on the, like, do you, are you optimistic about the future of X or are you, you know, one of these haters? I am, on, uh, I am beyond bullish beyond beyond <laughs> excited i think I, look i'm gonna sound like the biggest stan fanboy whatever I, I think elon is the greatest entrepreneur of all time i, I don't even think it's close yeah, i don't even think even there's close. anybody close the reason being he, he's running he's a ceo or at least behind the scenes ceo of five billion dollar companies <laughs> right now yeah <laughs> and, and like like who, who could, that, that is just superhuman freak of nature you, you you're on a whole different whole different level like once in a once in a once in human history because somebody do what he's doing. So just that alone makes me almost almost refuse to question whatever he's doing. Because what do I freaking know? Mm -hmm. like, this guy, yeah. this guy's he's twenty steps ahead, and and uh, and so what do I know? But but I but from what I've seen and what I what he said publicly, I'm really really bullish on the changes because my the vision that I have of the future may be a little bit dystopic. But I think what's going to happen is people are just going to spend more and more time on their phones consuming mm -hmm. content. I think you know the the old movie Wally, -E, where people are just kind of sitting around watching screens all day. I think we're watching that happen. I think if the average time spent on a screen for a person who owned an iPhone three years ago was two hours, that's soon going to be five hours. That's soon going to be six hours. That's soon going to be seven hours. So who's getting who's getting paid by it for all of that uh, attention? It's the creators. And mm -hmm. Elon understands that. He, he also understands how valuable that is to advertisers. Assuming assuming we don't get so bad that everybody loses their jobs and, nobody, mm -hmm. and we're just on UBI or whatever. Uh, assuming that doesn't happen, then people are just going to be spending way more of their waking hours consuming, which means they're available to be served ads to for a much per greater percentage of the time that they're awake. And the people who are going to be there to to benefit from that, a lot of people will benefit from that, but 
specifically creators and specifically the type of creators who are creating the content that people spend a long time on again going back to that so what kind of content is that it's what we're doing i mean mm -hmm. if, if somebody is a podcast fan they're they're spending an hour or more on this podcast which by the way i, I have a i gotta I gotta call it 12 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, i could talk to you guys all day but so, so i think what he's doing is he's setting the platform up to be that video hosting long form content platform. And as soon as that, I mean, that's what Tucker's doing. That's why he's, that's why they're mm -hmm. promoting that. And any of the guys like us who can serve that content and make it good and have people spending hours on the app looking at our stuff, we're going to benefit from that increased attention. Yeah. I think um, they're probably going to have some sort of YouTube ad sense yes. type of thing very, very soon. And I'm surprised they don't have it yet. I think they just don't have enough people working <laughs> there. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Employees. Probably not. Um, he called a lot of like, like uh, just excess fat from the company. Um, yeah. People said he, he wouldn't be able to do it like Twitter would fall apart. I mean, it did at certain times, but hey, it's still around, right? So proved all the people wrong. So um, I yeah, I think if you focus on Twitter now, you really stand to benefit. You're, it's kind of like if you invest time into Twitter now, you're kind of betting on the future of its success. And Harrison, you're, you stand to benefit probably the most from three of us. Like if, if, if X succeeds like um is able to achieve the the like mission that elon set out for it, it you're gonna kill it because they're gonna be like an all-in-one platform um i think they made comparisons to like the dystopian chinese uh wechat app mm -hmm. which everyone just uses like a payment chat uh video sharing so on and so forth so yeah um i'm excited to see what happens next me too but, man. yeah, yeah that, that everything all in one vision that he has and and the money behind that is driven by ads still that's that's not going to change um a little bit of subscription revenue which is which is nice to diversify but driven by ads and to have those ads you got to have people posting content that gets people hooked and so yeah. the people that are doing that are the people that are gonna win from this amazing well um being mindful of the time harrison where, where can people find you where do you want to push people um oh Twitter, man well, your newsletter where, where do you yeah, want yeah yeah so first off i want to thank you guys uh like we, i hinted at at the beginning we, we had some scheduling issues on, on my end trying to get this done and i'm so grateful to have had the chance to chat with you guys i love doing this stuff and so say at save your sons on twitter at save dot your dot sons on instagram <laughs> um you just google save your sons and it's the first thing that'll pop up you can see all my stuff and the other thing i really want to tell people about is uh i mentioned it a minute ago my kids podcast it's called froggy the gator froggy the gator <laughs> and it's uh and here's here's what it, the, the point of this thing so it, when you have kids you start realizing that the media they consume is really important it, it changes it shapes the way they view mm -hmm. the world and i realized that the media my kids were consuming they don't watch much tv at all but like even the books and stuff it had some messages in there i didn't really agree with so my idea was let's give it all let's give them an alternative and so i'm really investing heavily just from a time and and advertising standpoint in creating these characters and creating this world uh, that's starting out as a kid's podcast with, with books and videos to come later so if you if you got kids or if you just want to support that go follow froggy the gator you can google that one too it's right at the top it's about mm -hmm. a little it's about a guy and his friends and they they imagine fun thing fun scenarios my kids love it i've gotten a ton of great feedback from it froggy the gator follow us on apple podcast follow us on spotify give us a review and and that'll help a lot to uh to advance this initiative perfect great looks great man um <laughs> amazing well th thanks for coming on it was fun to chat yeah jackie james you guys man I, I, we got to do it again sometime i really appreciate the opportunity for sure sounds good sounds good